committee will come to order. This is a hearing on transparency through technology evaluating the Federal open government efforts. And uh, let me read our mission statement for this committee so it will be very clear on why we are here. Uh, we exist as the oversight and, gov and government reform uh, to uh, secure two fundamental principles. First, Americans have a right to know that the money Washington takes from them is well spent. Second, Americans deserve an efficient government that works for them. Our duty on the Oversight and Government Reform Committee is to protect these rights. Our solemn responsibility is to hold government accountable to taxpayers because taxpayers have the right to know what they get from their government. We will work tirelessly in partnership with citizen watchdogs to deliver the facts to the American people and bring genuine reform to Federal bureaucracy. This is the mission of the Oversight and Government Reform Committee. I'll make a quick statement of, of what I think we are headed towards today on that. Focus today's today's hearing transportation or transportation transparency through technology. The oversight uh, committee has a strong history of promoting advancements in this area. During the 111th Congress, under the leadership of then Chairman Towns and then Ranking Member ISA, the committee worked on a bipartisan basis to pursue technology-driven transparency initiatives. I look forward to continuing that work and joining the administration in its efforts to fully implement its open government directive and other transparency-related initiatives. President Obama, while in the Senate. Joined, then Senator, uh, joined Senator Coburn in shepherding the passage of the Federal Funding Accountability and Transparency Act. This Act required the administration to create a single searchable website accessible by the public at no cost that would provide information on all transactions over $25,000. The result was USAspending.gov, first launched in December 2007. President Obama and Senator Coburn deserve great praise for having the foresight to mandate that the Federal Government use available technologies to meet the public's right to know how, the, how their tax dollars are being spent. Unfortunately, despite a number of expensive makeovers, USAspending.gov still fails to achieve the total goal at three years after its launch because of some well-known data quality issues that we will discuss, I am sure, as we go through. Data for USAspending.gov comes from two sources, one that collects information from Federal agencies on contract expenditures and one that collects information from Federal agencies on grants, loans and other spending. GEO has reported that these two data sources are riddled with errors largely due to human error and a lack of agency oversight over its data submissions. The administration's data.gov initiative is similar to USAspending.gov. It is a commendable area and one that, in principle, I agree with wholeheartedly. Federal government collects and generates an enormous amount of data that is largely invisible to the American citizen but was paid for by the American citizen. This data is also invisible to the reporter or watchdog group that is trying to hold the government accountable or the entrepreneur who might be able to take that data and create new products, services or jobs in ways never contemplated by the Federal bureaucracy. Unfortunately, the implementation of data.gov has not matched its promise. The administration required agencies to publish at least three high-value data sets that had not previously been published. There was little guidance, however, as what to what constituted a high-value data set. As the Sunlight Foundation director um, has said of this, uh, the government has some pretty interesting ideas about what they regard as high-value data. The Department of the Interior seems to think the population count of wild horses in, in burrows is a high value, but records of safety violations is not. We want to see data that can be used to hold the, hold the government and entities that report to it accountable. Data about spending, department missions and personnel are noticeably absent from data.gov. If this data was public, it would save time and expenses as groups request basic reports and data from their government. This is highlighted by an article in Politico yesterday detailing how a watchdog group has been requesting long-term budget projections from OMB that were available in previous years, but they are now being withheld. In addition to data quality and data value, I hope to discuss with our witnesses today the issue of data standards and interoperability among Federal data systems. If a taxpayer wants to look at how much an agency plans to spend on a particular program from and how much Congress ultimately appropriates and then matches that figure with information from USA spending on the organizations that receive funding from the program and then compare that with the information on the impacts of the program from information published on data.gov, he or she simply couldn't do it. These data systems lack the common data standards and are not interoperable. Not only do they lack a common data standard, they sometimes violate even the most basic data standards in areas like separating the State field from the address field to allow for easy searches. I look forward to hearing from our witnesses today and hope that we can begin a fruitful discussion of what is working, what isn't, what are the next steps each of us should take to ensure that the Federal Government is utilizing all the technology available to provide true transparency to the American public. I do want to take this moment to commend the work done by OMB for Recovery.gov, Data.gov and USAspending.gov. This is the first administration to make this kind of data available and the first attempt will always have some errors. It is not our intent today to belittle the efforts of this administration, only to discover the important lessons learned and to hear the steps that are being taken to move things forward. 
I will now defer to the Ranking Member for his opening statement. Um, thank you, Chairman Lankford. And I want to applaud you for your decision to hold this hearing and for the tone you have set uh, in your opening statement uh, about the subject matter and the administration. Too often oversight focuses only on failures, when our role should be to rectify failures while publicizing and encouraging the dissemination of best practices. In the case of Federal Transparency and Technology, consider where we were four short years ago. There was no centralized site for citizens to read about Federal spending. Projects in the Congressional District are summaries of investments from major bills like the Recovery Act. Today, citizens can access comprehensive Federal spending information at usaspending.gov. As a result of House rules adopted under the previous Congress, all earmark requests have also been posted on each member's website for each of the last two years. Finally, thanks to Recovery.gov, all Recovery Act investments have been readily accessible to anyone with an Internet access. These reforms have been a collaborative effort. Then Senator Obama and Senator Coburn wrote legislation to consolidate information on Federal spending, the result of which was USAspending.gov. The House adopted rules to require public disclosure of earmarks to be posted online. President Obama undertook an unprecedented effort to make public his administration's implementation of the Recovery Act, as well as information technology and other investments. Finally, nongovernmental organizations have monitored the accuracy of those reporting instruments, and their efforts have identified and suggested ways to improve the reliability of the reported data. As we continue to expand these transparency initiatives, I believe we should demand that we are receiving the greatest possible utility for these programs. Resources dedicated to reporting should lead to greater public understanding and promote accountability. As the government works toward achieving transparency goals, we need to consider any impact that greater reporting costs may have on the infrastructure and educational investments this country needs. During this period of budget uncertainty, these potential tradeoffs are real considerations and that I hope all of our witnesses today will also address. Another question is how we report and consider the benefits of Federal spending programs. It is important for our constituents to understand what they are getting from a Federal investment as it is to understand how much money is being spent, because not all spending is the same. Not all spending has the same impact on the quality of life or on the economy. In addition, as we consider the results of different expenditures, it is important to treat all Federal expenditures equally, that is, including those buried in the, including those buried in the tax code. Tax expenditures account for over $1 trillion in foregone revenue annually. While tax expenditures differ from other spending in form, in reality these are simply spending and policy programs administered by the IRS. Of course, many tax expenditures have a valid purpose, but as a whole, they do not receive the same scrutiny as direct expenditures, even though they have the same impact on the Federal budget. They are not listed on USAspending.gov and are not subject to the accountability mechanisms that apply to other forms of spending. The Fiscal Commission recommended that Congress carefully consider the impact of tax expenditures on the budget. And I believe that this committee should look into those opportunities to make sure these IRS-administered spending programs are working for all Americans and not just those receiving the tax break. I look forward to working with members of the subcommittee and with you, Mr. Chairman, to ensure that we are working toward this comprehensive presentation of Federal expenditures and their impacts. And I yield back. Thank you. I would like to recognize, as many of you may know, this is a subcommittee of oversight and government reform. We do have the committee chairman for the committee as a whole uh, here, and uh, I would like to recognize Chairman Issa for an opening statement. I thank you, Chairman, and I would also recognize that the full committee ranking member is here. This is the most important issue of this committee in the long run. We are a committee that on a day-to-day -day basis obviously deals with the events, the failures in government, uh, and the need for reform short term. Today, like every other hearing that is about oversight, transparency, and getting it right, particularly in data reporting, we are dealing with what is ultimately going to be the fix. I came from a private sector where the idea that there would be data entry errors and that those data entry errors would be different than the actual payments was unheard of. If someone is typing in something for a report, rather than taking the actual data as it went out on a purchase order, an invoice, or some other disbursement, then by definition you are not giving people the honest results of what government did. 
you are giving them somebody's interpretation of the honest result. If they are completely accurate, then all you have wasted is a huge amount of human capital. If they are inaccurate, then you have data which is worthless. Today, I am very proud that I have a panel of four here, both government and very responsible people within the watchdog community to talk about transparency, to talk about uh, reporting, and to continue with our process of getting it right in the future. I regret we have a second panel. We have a second panel for an inexplicable reason that OMB has told us that they will not sit with nongovernment entities, that they have a longstanding policy. I have been here only going on 11 years, but it is not that long a policy. I would hope that in the future we can have the responsible people who are in the data use business and the data transparency business as often as possible when appropriate and vetted with the government people who are charged with working to do that. Today's hearing is not the first and it won't be the last in this process. Until every dollar from the time it leaves the taxpayer's account or, and for that matter, uh, the, uh, the, the dollar deposited when you want to go into a Federal park, until the last dollar is spent and dispersed, either used to pay a Federal employee or dispersed through the system in the private sector, until that is accounted from womb to tomb, we will not have done our job. When we get to that point, then the job that we all want done, which is full accountability with virtually no loss, theft or waste, will be possible. Today it is not possible. This hearing is important because the failures to get the data right is the reason that ultimately we are not getting the responsible government. And day after day, when we are told $100 billion, $200 billion, $300 billion would be saved if we simply stopped disbursements to people or to entities which do not deserve them. So until we get there, this committee will have no more important issue than the one we are here today. This is a subcommittee hearing, but you have both of the chair and ranking member for the reason that the work you are doing is the most important work of the Congress. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would also like to recognize the ranking member of the uh, entire committee as well. Mr. Cummings, glad that you are here. Uh, would be welcome to receive your opening statement. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And um, to Chairman Lankford and Ranking Member Connolly, certainly to uh, Chairman Issa and uh, other members in our panel. It is certainly a pleasure to have our witnesses here. And, you know, I was just um, listening to all of what has been said. And it is true that you play a very important role. Right now, we are in a big struggle here in the Congress. Just this morning, I had to explain to some Morgan State University students why it is that they are, many of them may not be able to go to school next year uh, because their Pell Grants are being slashed. I, and it is painful because many of those students will never return to school. They will never go back, come back. We were losing, I sit on the board of that school and have been there for the last 12 years. And we were losing students even with the Pell Grants as they are, but when they get slashed, it gets worse. Then I thought about on, as I was just sitting here, thought about a town hall meeting I had on Saturday where people came up to me and said, um, we've got 250 kids in Head Start but we got 750 on the waiting list. And so what does that have to do with all of this? It is about accountability. I agree with Mr. Issa, Chairman Issa, that we need to account for every single dime. If money is not being accounted for, there is a major problem. And that is a sad situation, particularly in a country where we can send folk to the moon, but we can't keep up with where the money is going. That is a major problem. And so I am grateful for this opportunity to examine the administration's ongoing efforts 
to bring increased transparency to the Federal Government. And I want to thank Chairman Lankford for giving this President some credit for something, for a change. This is an issue critical of critical importance, and the Federal Government must be held strictly accountable for its expenditures of taxpayers' hard-earned dollars. On April 15, there will be people figuring out, trying to figure out how they are going to pay the taxes. There are folks who, at the end of a week or two-week period, look at their pay stubs and scratch their heads and, you know, they, 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 they are barely making it now if they have a paycheck. And so we owe it to them to get it right. The passage of the Federal Funding Accountability and Transparency Act of 2006 and the establishment of the USAspending.gov, as required by the Act, have given the average American unprecedented ability to track Federal contracts and grants. This transparency increases the public's ability to hold elected representatives and Federal government accountable for distribution and the use of Federal funds. Further, the Act and the government's experience with USAspending.gov paved the way for the creation of additional websites that allow the public to track specific types of spending, including recovery.gov and data.gov. The Administration's ongoing efforts to improve the quality and breadth of data being reported are to be commended. In particular, I am pleased that in October 2010, the Administration began publishing sub-awards on USAspending.gov for the first time. However, the Sunlight Foundation September 2010 report shows that there is an opportunity to continue improving transparency and make additional information publicly available. In other words, we can always do better. During the last Congress, I supported legislation that moved through this committee to enhance the usability and the interoperability of Federal financial data. I look forward to working together in a bipartisan manner to advance such legislation in the Congress. OMB must also work to ensure that USAspending.gov implements mechanisms to improve the timeliness and accuracy of its reporting to the public. However, we should also be mindful that the pursuit of perfection in the reporting of spending data imposes real financial costs both in dollars and manpower, and such costs must be weighed against the benefits they will yield. I look forward to the witnesses' views on the issues today. And finally, let me say this. Any accounting of costs of government spending is inherently incomplete unless it also includes data detailing the revenue loss to the government through tax breaks and incentives to the wealthiest individuals and businesses, including businesses that move jobs overseas as children will be thrown out of Head Start or never get a Head Start, and as young people are thrown out of colleges. I look forward to the testimony of our witnesses and to working with Chairman Lankford and certainly Chairman Issa and Ranking Member Connolly to identify and address areas where the Federal transparency efforts can continue to be improved. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I thank you and I yield back. Thank you. All of the members will have seven days to submit opening statements and other materials for the record. I would like to now welcome and introduce the members of the panel, then I will lay some basic ground rules and then love to receive your testimony from there. Uh, Ms. Ellen Miller is the co-founder and executive director of the Sunlight Foundation. She is the founder of two other prominent Washington-based organizations in the field of money and politics, the Center for Responsive Politics and Public Campaign, and nationally recognized expert on transparency and the influence of money in politics. Thank you for being here. Mr. Chris Smith is the Chief Information Officer for the Department of Education. Mr. Smith previously served as the Chief Information Officer for Rural Development at the U.S. Department of Education and as the Information Technology Director for Financial Information at the General Services Administration. Thank you. Uh, switching people back there, Mr. Harris is the Chief Information Officer of the Department of Agriculture. Did I get those two reversed? I did, actually. I looked at you and I was like, I got those two reversed. I apologize for that. Um, so take all the education stuff and apply it to Mr. Harris. Let me switch to Mr. Smith. How about that? Mr. Smith is the Chief Information Officer, Department of Agriculture. Um, the, uh, Mr. Smith previously served as the Deputy Chief Financial Officer for the Department. I understand that Mr. John Holliday, the CFO for the Department of Agriculture, will also be advising uh, Mr. Smith. So when everyone stands to be sworn in, if you would also stand and be sworn in as well. 
Mr. Jerry Brito is a senior research fellow at the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. He is the author of several published scholarly articles and a contributor to the Technology Liberation Front, a leading tech policy blog. He is also the creator of Unclutter, a popular blog about personal organization and simple living that is read by a quarter million people each month. It is a nice reading list. Uh, let me uh, give you a, the gr ground rules for our hearing itself here. Uh, each of you has been asked to submit a written statement for the record. We have also asked you to prepare an oral statement no longer than five minutes. We will allow time for question uh, on your statement after that. You will see on your desk a series of lights and a clock, which will count down from five minutes. The lights will change from green to yellow to red when your time has expired, and it will be time at that point to quickly wrap up. After all, the panel has given their oral statements. Each member will, uh, present will have five minutes to ask questions of the panel. Many members uh, may have several questions, so it is very important that you answer your questions very concisely. Uh, do, do not feel you have to give a lengthy answer on anything. Please also forgive the members of this committee as we excuse ourselves. Most of us have multiple committee assignments going on this morning. We are juggling concurrent meetings. Uh, Mr. Connolly just had to slip out and head to the floor of the House as we have things going on there as well right now. Your testimony will be recorded and it will be available for review by all of us, and I can assure you it is written down every every bit of it, and we will be able to review it in days to come. So thank you. Though each member completely chooses the content of their five minutes of questioning, I would ask the members honor our guest time and attendance by prioritizing answers and information from them instead of making speeches. I would also ask all of our members not to ask a question past their five-minute time. Once it is expired, as the Chairman, I reserve the right to remind everyone that time has expired and ask for, ask for proper decorum in our, in our hearings. We will have two panels this morning. Uh, the first will include Mrs. Miller, Mr. Smith, Mr. Harris, and Mr. Brito. The second will have only Mr. Werfel. It is my understanding that Office of Management and Budget did not want to sit on a panel with nongovernment witnesses, so we have honored their request for Mr. Werfel to be separated from the other witnesses. <clears throat> we will hear his testimony. We will hear the testimony of the first panel. When we conclude that testimony and our questions, we will immediately move to the testimony and questions from Mr. Werfel individually. We are very grateful for all the time you have committed to preparing your written and your oral statements and time you have given away from your family for this hearing. Do you understand all the ground rules of this hearing? Thank you. It is the policy of the committee that all witnesses be sworn in before they testify. For all of you that are uh, going to be doing any testimony, would you please rise? <clears throat> please raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you are about to give this committee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Thank you. Please be seated. I would like to recognize Mrs. Miller for five minutes. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chairman Langford, uh, Ranking Member Connolly, um, and um, uh, Mr. Cummings, um, and members of the committee, thank you for the invitation to appear before you today. My name is Ellen Miller, and I am co-founder and executive director of the Sunlight Foundation, a nonpartisan nonprofit dedicated to using the power of the Internet to catalyze greater government openness and transparency. We take our inspiration from Justice Brandeis's famous adage, sunlight is said to be the best of disinfectants. The public has a right to know how its government works. Recent Congresses deserve congratulations for taking concrete steps toward embracing a 21st century vision of transparency. Initiatives from this administration, like the Open Government Directive, are emblematic of a willingness to take transparency seriously. Unfortunately, the Open Government Directive's value has proven to be largely aspirational. While establishing positive transparency norms is hugely important, we believe that government must now focus on the harder challenges. It is no longer enough to acknowledge transparency's importance. Transparency initiatives must be accurate, complete, and useful, as well as timely. There is perhaps no better example of the tension between show and tell than USAspending.gov. Disclosure of the ways in which the public's money is spent is among the most important types of government transparency. Congress recognized this in 2006 with the passage of the Federal Funding, Accountability and Transparency Act, which required that information about Federal grants, contracts, loans and insurance be placed online in a searchable website known as USAspending.gov. In the course of their work, Sunlight researchers have become deeply familiar with the data powering USAspending.gov. As we began to examine these systems, we were aware that the quality of the data sets was widely considered problematic. Our work quickly confirmed that data suffered from irregularities. However, we were anxious to reach an even more complete understanding of the problem, so we dug in. In order to do so, we needed a reference point against which we could compare the USA spending data. 
Unfortunately, the complexities of the Federal budget make both the budget and, and Treasury expenditure data unsuitable for that use. We found our yardstick in the Catalog of Federal Domestic Assistance, an index of many Federal programs, including program descriptions and yearly obligation amounts. Although not strictly designed for this use, CFDA has been used for comparative analysis by GAO in the past. We took their methodology and expanded it. Like GAO, we looked for mismatches in amounts between CFDA and USA spending data, allowing a generous margin of error to account for differences in the systems. We also looked for instances in which reports had been made within statutory deadlines and for incomplete reports. Finally, we automated GAO's sample-based methodology so that we could examine the entire database, which consists of hundreds of thousands of records. The results were sobering. We found over $1.2 trillion worth of misreported spending in 2009 alone. Some of the most serious problems appear to be caused by the agency's failure to meet their reporting obligations. The USDA website lists the cost of their school breakfast program and lunch programs at $12.7 billion, but only 250,000 of these costs are reported on USAspending.gov. The Maritime Administration has never reported the spending associated with any of its loan or insurance programs and reports only a fraction of its grant activity. These are just two examples. Almost every agency has one or more programs that fail to report their spending. And the spending that is, often, that is reported is often incomplete or incorrect. For example, each loan record is required to include both the subsidy cost and the face value of the loan. Unfortunately, the subsidy cost is incorrectly reported as zero for over 85 percent of the loan records and the face value of all FY 2010 student loans was reported as $6.9 trillion, an amount greater than the entire Federal budget. Clearly, that number is wrong. We do not believe that these problems are the fault of USAspending.gov website or the people that maintain it. Indeed, USA Spending deserves praise for its growth and improvement. When we conducted this analysis, we had to send a hard drive out to Maryland to get the data. Today we can download it directly from the website. Similarly, we are pleased to see the Administration finally begin to offer the subaward data maintained by FAFADA. But these improvements will be meaningless for the vast majority of users if the underlying data is not reliable. Agencies typically use purpose-built internal systems for managing their spending that are separate from the public reporting systems and much more accurate. In essence, they maintain two sets of books, one of which is habitually neglected. But this latter system is vitally important for both the public and government planning efforts. And until the agencies begin to take these responsibilities more seriously, Federal spending transparency will remain an unfulfilled promise. We welcome the Committee's attention to this issue and encourage you to continue to spend time in engaging oversight and legislative efforts on this important topic. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. And my colleagues and I, Tom Lee and Caitlin Lee, look forward to your questions. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Dr. Harris, I am going to appropriately recognize you at this point. So thank you for being here and we receive your testimony. Thank you and good morning, Chairman Langford and members of the subcommittee. Thank you for the opportunity to appear before the subcommittee today. My name is Danny Harris and I am the Chief Information Officer at the U.S. Department of Education. Uh, a position I have had the privilege to hold since October 2008. I am very pleased to discuss the Department's transparency efforts specific to the Open Government Initiative. On his first day in office, the President sent a memo directing all Federal agencies to create unprecedented levels of openness in government. The Department of Education has taken this directive very seriously. Our Open Government Plan makes our efforts more transparent, participatory and collaborative. I am personally committed to these goals and the Department looks forward to building upon the solid foundation put in place during the first two years of this initiative. For decades, the Department has collected, analyzed and used data to inform our delivery of services. At the Department of Education, we collect data about the overall condition and effectiveness of education provided by the States, local educational agency and institutions of higher education. A key part of our mission is to provide useful information to States assisting their efforts to allocate resources to education citizens in the most effective and efficient way. Equally important to our mission is supporting the use of Federal resources 
toward ensuring fair access to education for all. Open government efforts place special emphasis on providing information to the public leading to increased transparency and to the information we and States use for decision making. At the Department of Education, we have established a cross-functional team to develop our open government plan, which is available on our website. Also, we have established a governing body to oversee departmental execution of the open government plan and to improve the efficiency and effectiveness of all of the information collection and dissemination activities at the Department. Decisions and recommendations from this Board will and do affect IT spending. This coordinated effort will effectively manage duplicate data requests, it will reduce burdens to the States and local agencies, and it will optimize Department-wide data aggregation. At the end of the day, it is not just about the data that we deliver, it is about delivering tools to drive innovation. Prior to implementing open government efforts, we provided similar information in tool sets, allowing citizens to view the information in ways that we thought were useful. Open government altered this framework, and now we deliver the same information in a raw, machine-readable format, allowing citizens to analyze the data and transform those data into useful, aggregated information. This access to data has undoubtedly created new insights and views, enabling, enabling previously unthought of ways for citizens to understand, view, and track Federal dollars. The clear benefit is that citizens can now view the delivery of services with comprehensive information, and the public's ability to access and analyze these data make Federal spending transparent. In turn, this helps ensure Departments are accountable for results and uh, outcomes. The challenge for the Department is to ensure the quality of this data. We view key attributes of quality as timeliness, accuracy, and most of all, privacy. The challenge for our stakeholders is to establish proper awareness and context for these data. We have already seen positive outcomes as a result of these initiatives. For example, in our Race to the Top program, we provided a detailed description of the process used to review and select the winners of that program. The Department, in implementing Race to the Top, has demonstrated unprecedented transparency by posting all of the applications as well as peer reviewer scores and comments to the public for review. To help spur innovation, our Investing in Innovation team created an open innovation portal, a website where education innovators can share ideas and collaboration, where funders and educators can point out their needs, and where people can gather to propose, develop, fund, implement, and more than anything else, improve solutions inside and outside of the classroom. We take the commitment to transparency seriously at all levels within the Department. For example, in 2009, Secretary Duncan launched, launched his Listening and Learning Tour. He did this to engage the public directly in discussing education reform in America. The Department used the input we received to prepare a blueprint for reauthorizing the Elementary and Secondary Education Act. Transparency through technology provides an opportunity to engage with the public in making the Department of Education more accountable. Specifically, the Department has a significant role in complying with the Federal Funding and Accountability Transparency Act due to the very large number of grants, contracts, and loans that we administer. These funds go to numerous recipients and subrecipients in States and territories, and the public should know where these funds are going, for what purpose, and most importantly, what results they should expect. We submit grant and loan funding transactions on a biweekly basis from our grant system in the Federal Assistance Award data system file layout. Additionally, we provide our contract funding transactions to the Federal Procurement data system in real time during contract award. Both our grants and contract systems are integrated with the Department's general ledger. This ensures that the transactions that we submit to USAspending.gov are directly retraceable to our financial systems. Finally, the Privacy Act and Federal guidelines govern how we protect personally identifiable information while at the same time complying with the Transparency Act and other public reporting requirements. In conclusion, I believe that open government, USAspending.gov, Federal reporting, and other recovery websites all work together to put more and better information in the hands of the public. The benefits are tremendous because these efforts lead to increased accountability, transparency, and more than anything else, recognizable links between spending and results. Thank you, Chairman and members of the subcommittee, for your attention to this important issue, and I would be happy to answer any questions you may have. Right. Thank you, Dr. Harris. Mr. Smith. 
Thank you, Chairman Lankford, Ranking Member Connolly, members of the subcommittee, uh, Chairman Issa, was, who, who was with us here earlier. Thank you for this opportunity to share with you our progress on the implementation of the Open Government Initiatives on transparency and accountability and the use of information technology to further these important goals. I am joined today by my colleague, John Holliday, who is the USDA Acting Chief Financial Officer uh, just behind me. USDA programs touch every American and many others around the world every day, and we are focused on the activities that ensure an economically thriving rural America that we are conserving our national forests and private working lands and promoting sustainable agricultural production and biotechnology exports to ensure and increase food security, and to provide access to a nutritious diet for all Americans. Full and easy access to information on government spending promotes accountability by allowing detailed tracking and analysis of the deployment of these resources. This tracking and analysis allows the public and public officials to gauge the effectiveness of expenditures and to monitor spending patterns to achieve the best possible results. Transparency also gives the public confidence that we are properly managing its funds. From the Transparency Act of 2006 to the OpenGov Directive of 2009, government transparency has become the cornerstone for information access to facilitate participation and collaboration across Federal, State and local governments and with the public. USDA is a strong advocate of government transparency and is striving to meet both the letter and intent of the Open Government Directive. On December 8, 2009, the White House issued the Open Government Directive requiring Federal agencies to take specific actions to promote transparency, collaboration and participation. The Open Government Directive puts accountability and accessibility at the center of how Federal Government operates. It instructs agencies to share information with the public through online, open, accessible and, as my colleague has stated, machine-readable formats. USDA fully supports the Administration's Directive for Open Government and is actively engaged on this front in making the Department more accessible and accountable to our citizens. To foster accessibility, USDA launched its OpenGov website in the spring of 2010 and published an Open Government Plan describing how USDA would improve transparency and integrate public participation and collaboration into its activities. With the launch of our website, citizens are able to learn about and comment on USDA information and post their ideas on transparency collaboration and actively participate with the Department. The public can also post ideas to help USDA become more efficient and more effective in everything that we do. Additionally, to improve outreach initiatives, USDA has established an open government communication plan which describes USDA's interaction and collaboration and details the activities that we are taking. USDA is leveraging information technology to improve transparency and cre increase citizen interaction and participation. Two good examples are USDA's My Pyramid and Apps for Healthy Kids, uh, which are innovative approaches to USDA reaching out and encouraging collaboration with the private sector and the public. The ap Applications for Healthy Kids competition was, a, competition was a collaborative project that challenged the general public to design online mobile gaming tools and educational applications uh, to educate people about the importance of healthy eating and physical activity. USDA's Food and Nutrition Service, Department of Health and Human Services, First Lady Michelle Obama's Let's Move initiative and the NFL's Fuel Up to Play 60 played a vital role in this challenge, and over 45,000 participants sub submitted 95 games and applications with 12 su submissions uh, selected as the ultimate winners. Additionally, as a part of the USDA Open Government flagship initiatives, the Forest Service directly improved transparency, collaboration and participation by increasing public participation in the development of its land management planning rule by leveraging information technology to improve collaboration and interaction. Using Web 2.0 technologies and online collaborative environments, the agency provided the public with updates on the planning rule process and enabled them to submit comments. The agency also held public meetings and listening sessions all over the country to gain input from these citizens. More than 700 individuals were not able to attend these in person, and using collaborative technologies, they were able to participate uh, remotely. The development of this proposed rule involved more than 26,000 comments on the notice of intent and more than 40 public meetings, with over 3,000 participants, including a national science forum, tribal consultation, and Forest Service employees submitting comments. This increased focus on accountability and transparency builds upon our commitment to strong financial stewardship, as evidenced by USDA compliance with the Transparency Act. In September of 2006, the Transparency Act was enacted as required by the Act. The Office of Management and Budget established the USAspending.gov website to provide transparency of Federal spending by disclosing entities receiving the funds. USDA sends biweekly transmissions to the Federal financial assistance system with over 25 reporting any award over $25,000. We report the key data elements regarding Federal award within 30 days after that award, and USDA's data is being reported to the public include grants, cooperative agreements, direct and guaranteed loans, direct payments, insurance and contracts. 
USDA has a comprehensive information technology modernization strategy that encompasses the improvement of this data collection and the sharing of that with our citizens. I look forward to your questions and discussion, sir. Thank you. You could not have been closer on time as well. Thank you, Mr. Smith, on that one as well. Mr. Brito, please get your uh, uh, oral testimony in five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Thank you for inviting me to testify on transparency through technology. As someone who believes that Internet-enabled transparency can lead to better and more accountable government, I am gratified by government's efforts in this space over the past five years. Transparency is an issue that has been genuinely embraced by both sides of the political aisle. And what was once an esoteric concept, that meaningful transparency requires disclosures to be online in an open, searchable, and machine-readable format, has become a generally accepted ideal. Those are great strides. However, despite the Obama Administration's technological efforts and congressional legislation like the Federal Funding Accountability and Transparency Act, whether government is performing effectively is still not completely transparent. That is because the vast majority of newly available data is not about government. And disclosures that are about government tend to report its activities, not data on program outcomes. When program outcomes are reported, they tend to be suspect because they are self-measured and self-reported by program managers. On data.gov, the government has compiled wonderful, never-before-available data sets about regulated industries, but little about its own performance. Excluding the 305,000 data sets that pertain to geodata, the data.gov data catalog makes available just over 3,000 raw data sets. Of these, about half are related to the toxic release inventory compiled by the EPA. These are disclosures about regulated entities that, while very valuable to individuals and researchers, tell us little about the performance of government. A quick scan of the remaining 1,500 data sets reveals that only 200 to 300 report on the activities or performance of government. There is plenty of smoke but little fire. One of the better data sets available is research.gov. This National Science Foundation database of federally funded science and engineering research allows users to search for grants by keyword, location, or grantee, see which grants were awarded and for how much, and learn about the results of each uh, specific federally funded research project. This information is useful in holding government accountable for its performance. Less useful, although no doubt valuable to some researchers, are data sets like one from the U.S. Geological Survey on the effect of fire on Rocky Mountain olive-sided flycatcher bird nests. Spending transparency sites like USAspending.org and the Recovery.gov site are also useful because they disclose government's actions. They allow citizens, watchdogs, bloggers, and reporters access to the raw data of the business of government, and it allows them to make creative uses of the data, including making interesting mashups and allowing them to crowdsource accountability. However, these types of sites are not perfect. As the Sunlight Foundation and others have pointed out, the quality of the data available can be sorely lacking. Also, until recently, only information about the primary recipient of a contract grant uh, award or was available on USAspending.org, th thus limiting the usefulness of the site. More broadly, while spending sites can help uncover instances of fraud, waste, and abuse, which is very important, they, they are nevertheless less helpful in measuring performance because they simply disclose, disclose outputs, amounts of money dispersed, the recipients, and simple descriptions of contracts or grants. To determine whether a program is performing as intended, the public needs information not only about outputs but about outcomes. With a Federal spending crisis on our hands, Congress must soon decide which programs to cut and which to keep. Voters will have to decide if they support Congress's choices. The whole process would be much easier if information existed about the relative performance of government programs. In the private sector, a corporation must disclose its earnings, as well as its expenditures and assets on a quarterly basis. Such an objective measure of performance not only allows the market to set a stock price, but it also allows shareholders to hold management accountable. Now, think of government transparency. All agencies and programs disclose their expenditures in an annual budget and through sites like USAspending.gov. What government does not report are earnings figures for the simple reason that there are none. Therefore, a government program may be transparent, and yet the public sees only half of the balance sheet. Congress tried to solve this problem with the Government Performance and Results Act. The problem with GIPRA performance reporting, however, is that uh, the very managers that run the programs are charged with developing performance measures, measuring their own programs, and writing self-evaluating performance reports. Even in the NSF's research.gov site, which I mentioned, it is the award recipients who write the performance reports. In the private sector, Congress has recognized that this doesn't work. Congress has required that publicly traded companies must hire independent third-party auditors to help prepare and certify reports. And the Sarbanes-Oxley uh, Act, uh, um, corporate managers are personally liable for the veracity of those reports. Congress might want to consider similar, similar independent audits of agency performance reporting. I am looking forward to the launch of the new Performance.gov initiative by OMB, which promises to provide data-driven reviews of progress toward clearly defined goals at Federal agencies. 
Those reviews, however, won't be very meaningful if they are self-reported or based on shaky data. The progress Congress and the Obama administration have made in making transparency, and especially online transparency, a key objective for government cannot be overstated. The culture of secrecy that has long pervaded Federal agencies is beginning to change. However, we must make sure that open government is first and foremost about transparency, and that transparency is clearly understood as disclosure of government's performance in the service of greater accountability. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much. Thank all of you for preparing the, the statement. Uh, I would like to begin. I have five minutes allotted. I am going to yield those five minutes to my Vice Chairman, uh, Mr. Kelly, for him to start our opening questions. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you all for being here today. Um, I come from the private sector, so I have a little bit of idea about having skin in the game. And, uh, Mr. Reed, I am really interested when you talk about the principal uh, and the agent re uh, reporting uh, program. As I have always thought in my business, you don't want the fox watching the hen house. So could you expand a little bit more on where we should go with this? Because I am having an awful tough time following uh, some we, we talk the talk, but we don't walk the walk in government, and we tell you how you should do it, but we never do it ourselves. So if you could just expand a little bit on what the purpose would be in having an outside agency looked at, because in my business, I always bring in outside auditors. I would never, ever do it internally. It gives you a false picture. It gives you a completely unrealistic idea of what is going on with your business. And I will tell you, the number one thing that I find out when we hire a new person, they come in after their first pay and they say, I, I thought I was getting paid more. I said, well, this is what we paid you. Now look through all the deductions and this is what you are taking home. So there is a huge difference between what we pay and what they take home. And they ask me, where did it go? I said, well, take a look and you can find out. It went to the government. And they said, well, what the heck are they doing with my money? I said, you know what, that is anybody's guess, isn't it? So if you could just tell me a little bit about what you would suggest as far as outside auditors. Sure. Well, uh, <clears throat> economists will talk about a concept called principal agent problem, which is very simple. You, uh, let's say you have a corporation which is owned by shareholders, thousands of shareholders. They hire a board of directors to manage a corporation. The board hires a CEO and the management. Now, the board can't be behind watching the CEO all the time. Um, and, and so for that reason, I mean, that is the very reason why they hire managers to manage a corporation. Um, quarterly, yearly, the board meets to review the performance of management. Uh, how do they, uh, what sort of data do they look at? Well, they look at profit and loss, and it is very clear. Uh, with government, we don't have profit, for profit and loss, so we need to uh, develop performance uh, measurement. And what, the way that works is very simply, this is what Congress did in the Government Performance and Results Act, which is that for a program, uh, the agency before it begins a program needs to say, uh, these are the results we expect to achieve. These are the data-driven measurements that we will use to determine whether we met those results. And then at the end of the, of, of the period, whether it is a year or quarterly, uh, you measure and you see whether you met those results. If you didn't meet those results, well, then Congress can can go look at that program, see how it can be fixed, see if it needs to be eliminated. Uh, unfortunately, the, uh, the responsibility of creating the measurements, of measuring and of reporting is all on the very same agency that runs the program. And, and so that creates, again, this principal agent pro uh, pr problem. In the private sector, you wouldn't expect simply to take management's word about the performance of the company. You bring in a third-party auditor. That is required by Congress. But even if it wasn't required by Congress, I would suspect uh, that um, our shareholders and board members would want to audit the information presented to them by management. And so that is that's, that's what I am suggesting, is that we take a lesson from that uh, uh, in, in the private sector and, and bring it into uh, government. And, and I respect your, your, your uh, statement that we don't have profit, or uh, I would say we do have loss. <laughs> and and I have never seen any business that could run this way consistently, a trillion dollars in the red for three straight years, and feel that, hey, we are doing all right. Uh, Ms. Miller, and one of the things I found interesting is in your written testimony, it, it says that one of, the, one of the goals or the mission statement, sunlight is said to be the best of disinfectants. And, and I would ask you, and, and, and also, Mr. Brito, USAspending.gov and, reco and recovery.gov have been criticized for not containing the information that citizens are most interested in. What information do you think is the most important and which should be made more public? Um, well, um, I will be glad to, to answer that. I think um, our criticism um, with respect to the, ava the availability of data really applies to um, data.gov. Um, and we certainly agree with uh, Mr. Brito's assessment in terms of the amount of data that is actually on that site. Sunlight advocated with the administration 
that all the data that is made available by government be made, made available in machine readable formats. And as you heard from our uh, government colleagues here, um, the administration has done that. Um, but there is just very little information that is made available. It is hard for me to sit here as a resident of Washington, D.C., uh, and say what someone in your city uh, would be most interested in. But Sunlight has been exploring some of this, and, and we know people are interested desperately in health care issues, they are interested in education issues, they are interested in consumer-related banking issues. And so we are beginning actually to develop apps from the publicly made available, uh, the data that has been made available either on their own websites or on data.gov, uh, to, uh, to move into this sort of consumer-facing information that, that our best instincts tell us and need to be there, it has not been easy to find this kind of data immediately accessible. Uh, we just we need more of what citizens need. And, and the, I think the administration and the various agencies have been asking citizens what do they need, again, to their credit. We have to sort of pull back in maybe another six months and, and try to assess that as government. Okay. Thanks very much. My time has expired. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I recognize Mr. Lynch for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank the members of the panel for helping the committee with its work. Uh, I listened closely to, to your testimony. And uh, I just want to ask, Ms. Miller, uh, you reported uh, that uh, from the USDA website uh, they had listed the uh, school lunch program the cost of the school breakfast and lunch program, excuse me, uh, here in the United States uh, was $12.7 billion. However, according to the USDA, uh, their website lists the costs at about $250,000. Uh, actually, I think it was spending.gov that actually uh, listed it that way. And then we hear from Mr. Smith, God bless him, and it sounds like everything is going great over there. And I am just wondering if uh, you know, the, is that is that how you uh, if you've assessed the accuracy of the USDA reporting? Uh, how how would you uh, how would you uh, grade them? I guess. Well, well, we don't grade the agencies because I think all of them are struggling. So if we had to say which was better than the others, as I mentioned in my testimony, uh, almost I don't think there's a single agency that would get an A. So there, there are failures of, of different kind and substance throughout the agencies. Why those spending um, amounts are recorded so differently, I honestly cannot answer. But I suggest Mr. Smith might be able to, to answer why yeah. we see such discrepancies. Well, well let, let me ask you then. You, you say that uh, across the board that uh, agencies are keeping two sets of books. And this might be one example of, of that. They keep a, it may be. a set of books for operational purposes, but then when they report to the taxpayer, to the public, it is in a different format and it is difficult to reconcile. How, how, do, we, uh, how do we require that uh, the agencies reconcile that difference and, and give us usable, usable information? Because I, I do agree with my colleagues that sunlight is, is the best disinfectant, and that is the responsibility of this oversight committee to find out, you know, how much uh, is being spent, where it is being spent, is it being spent wisely. Uh, we had the, uh, the director of uh, the Office of Personnel Management here uh, earlier this week, and he could not tell me uh, the number of uh, contractors that we have for the U.S. government. He thinks it is around uh, 10 million, but I can't even find out, you know, how many folks we actually got out there working for the government. There's a lot of pressure on federal employees, but here we have these 10 million uh, contractors, at least, I guess, and uh, working for uh, different aspects of our government. And it just doesn't seem like we have a handle on this at all. So I, I, am, I applaud your efforts, and I, I don't mean to single anybody out, but we, we need a lot more work done on this. Yes, absolutely. And I think um, the first step to that is oversight. I, well, perhaps the first step was the analysis which the Sunlight Foundation has done and expanding that analysis. You know, Sunlight only looked at grants. We have not looked at any of the contract information that has been reported. So we have no idea of how much that We will get on that, will you? <laughs> Well, I am kidding, kidding. No, no, no. We, we have actually requested of the administration the necessary um, 
documents that we need to do that, and they have told us that we could not have that information. So we FOIA'd it six months ago, and we are still waiting because we would very much like to, to move into examining the grants, the quality of the grants. Thanks, Ms. But Miller. I, I do want to give Mr. Smith, in fairness, an opportunity to respond, uh, because I used, his, I used the example of, of the filing there as, as, a, as a glaring uh, example of uh, misreporting. So, Mr. Smith, have a whack at me. All Go right. ahead. Th thank you, Congressman Lynch. Uh, let me first say, uh, with transparency comes a, another set of eyes, always another set of eyes, and I think it is exceedingly important that as, as people identify those things, uh, if we have an anomaly, uh, we identify and we work through them. I think that, that is the value of transparency. So I think we appreciate the outside uh, view and the particular question that you asked and uh, that Ms. Miller brought up in her statement. Uh, on child nutrition programs in particular, when looking at the legislative intent of the uh, FATA Act uh, and that individuals not, would not be reported for awards, the school lunch program, and also being below $25,000 uh, for the first three years of that Act, we did not report individual awards. We have reassessed that as we have gone along as questions were raised, and at the beginning of this fiscal year, uh, child nutrition programs will be reported in there. So, again, I think it is a matter of what is being asked, how we are reporting it, and then how do you track that back to the authoritative records. And to the point on audits, uh, we are strong believers in audits, and every year we go through a financial audit, and we also do audits on our financial systems, SAS 70, to account for that. Thank you. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much for recognizing the Texan, Mr. Farenthold, for five minutes. Good morning, and thank you all, all for coming to visit with us. I, I just have a broad overview question. Do you think part of the data problems, and I guess I will direct that uh, to uh, Mr. Smith or Dr. Harris, because you work within the agencies, is, is there some level of accountability for the data that you report? I mean, is there, what procedures do you have in place to check that the stuff that you are publishing both on your website and sending to some of these collector websites is accurate? Thank you, Congressman, for the question. Uh, at the Department of Education, we are actually very proud of the quality of the data. And, and, and I say that because we have a, a four-way match. We do an extract before we submit data to uh, USAspending.gov, and we match that against our financial system, we match it against the data stream that we send, and then we match it against what is actually in USAspending.gov. Now, it does go through a treatment when it hits USAspending.gov, and that is when we get the opportunity to actually make those changes. But I do think at the core, and, and someone spoke about it earlier, I think at the core of data quality is having integrated systems such that human beings do not touch that data between source and reporting. And I think a large part of the reporting problem lies there. Thank you, Mr. Congressman. I would just echo uh, my colleague Dr. Harris's statement. We want to go to the authoritative data source. We don't want to reconcile it multiple times along the way. So, uh, you know, put it in once, read it many times, and do the reporting. I, I think the issue we face is there are sometimes subsets that we are looking at when you don't have the whole picture, and we are trying to recreate that is where we, we start to get differences in, in when one group is looking at one thing and the other. But we, we put a very repeatable, rigorous process in. Anytime there is a new requirement, uh, we try to go back to that authoritative source so we are not reworking it. Uh, we check from the agency subfeeder systems into the core financial system, do the edit check there, then we check it uh, at OMB before it goes into USA spending. So there are multiple checks in place, and, and certainly our first standard is high data quality and, and no rework. All right, and I guess Mr. Brito may be the one to ask this next question, but if anybody else wants to jump in, feel free. When we look at these, uh, and maybe Ms. Miller might kick in here too, when we look at these aggregator sites, are we comparing apples to apples? Is there an equivalent of generally accepted accounting practices uh, for the government? Are we just getting thrown uh, data as each individual agency uh, sees it and there is no real standard or accountability uh, where we know we are looking at you know, accurate, accurate data and able to do comparisons that are reasonable? Well, I mean, I would sort of defer to, to the Sunlight Foundation, but it is it's obvious that they had to FOIA information to do the reconciling. Um, uh, the answer is the data is, uh, you know, widely dissimilar. Um, and so whether um, the GAO's initial study that they did or the more complete analysis that we did, uh, we are finding all kinds of inconsistencies, um, whether it is um, consistency of how the data is entered, whether it is completeness of the data or the timeliness of it, 
uh, there are lots of problems. You know, I've been I've been thinking that um, you know the USAspending.gov is a, a relatively new phenomenon. It was passed in 2006. I think it was uh, available in 2007, and so I think the agencies are having trouble adjusting to the these aggregator sites. Um, but we have to figure this out further downstream, and I would certainly agree with the notion of the less human hands involved in this, the better and the more consistent reporting we will have across agencies. And Ms. Miller, let me ask you this. You had the Freedom of Information Act, uh, these agencies, for uh, information. Do you have an overall sense that the agencies are friendly to uh, publishing this information, or are you running into no's and agencies say we don't really want this information out? Um, let me clarify. We, um, we did not have to do a FOIA for any information for the original analysis that we did that focused on the quality of the grants reporting to USAspending.gov. We have had to create a FOIA to, to get the, the um, um, FPDS data for in, in order to do the contract analysis that we wish to do. Are, so the, are, are, you, are, are the agencies being cooperative or are you running into stone walls? Just well, we're, we actually don't receive the data from the agencies directly, so we have not had that kind of, inform, uh, we've not had that kind of interaction. We are taking the data from USAspending.gov and comparing it to other sources of government information. Thank you very much. I am out of time. Mr. Murphy, five minutes. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, just a few quick questions. Uh, Ms. Miller, I am interested in your experience with uh, Department of Defense data in particular. Um, this is the one agency that still cannot get a clean audit um, at the Federal Government level. It is uh, obviously the uh, largest pro procurement agency at the Federal level. There is an enormous amount of very important data there that I think even as members of Congress we don't always know whether we have um, <coughs> proper access to. And, and, I, and maybe you don't have an answer to this question, but I wanted to know um, about your experiences with the quality of data and the amount of data that comes out of the Department of Defense and how relevant that is to individuals that are trying to understand the decisions that are being made there and how that money is being spent. Right. Uh, let me consult with my colleagues just briefly to, to see what their experience has been with respect to DOD data on USAspending.gov. Um, my colleague, um, Caitlin uh, Lee, uh, reports that most of what happens at DOD is done through contracting. They do very little direct grants. We have only looked at the grants. But if we receive this FOIA information that we have requested, we will be able to report on that in about six months. So I am sorry we don't have that information. Well, I, 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 I bring that up because as we try to uh, grapple with a lot of complex spending questions, I think what uh, members find is that even, even we don't have access to important data. Certainly the public doesn't, and Mr. Brito is shaking his, uh, nodding his head, so I am happy to give you a, a chance at this question as, as well. But as a for instance, um, you know, when it comes to contracting decisions, what we found is that over the last uh, several years there has been a, mouse, a massive outflow of contracting contracts to overseas companies, and we get uh, just a shadow of data regarding those contracts. We know, for instance, uh, from year to year how many uh, waivers to the requirement to purchase here in America are granted, but we don't know anything more. Um, we get a report on the number of waivers, but we don't know what type of waivers they were, why the waivers were granted. Uh, and so there is a larger conversation from a statutory perspective that has to happen about what kind of data the public receives from the Department of Defense. But I will be very interested to hear the results of your contracting audit going forward, because I think there is a, a frustration in the public, especially with regard to DOD data. And, Mr. Brito, you are nodding your head, so I am happy to give you a chance at that as well. The only point I would like to make, bring it back to performance data, is that uh, DOD is one of um, uh, the least successful when it comes to performance data. One reason, perhaps, is that they have a quadrennial review process, and they sort of feel that is the place to do it. Um, when we talk about um, having requirements that an agency head certify performance data, um, the, Depart the uh, Secretary of Defense 
uh, for, uh, let's see, the, during the Bush administration, never signed um, the, 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 uh, uh, the certification. Never uh, uh, did. So that is something that we need to focus on. And just to switch uh, topics, um, uh, back to you, uh, Dr. Harris, um, uh, on this issue that was brought up earlier on student loans, um, you know, the uh, total amount in student loans on USAspending.gov is, you know, somewhere just south of $7 trillion. It is clearly not the right number. Um, and I wanted, just before the panel was up, to give you a chance to uh, maybe explain why uh, that number appears on, on the website and uh, w uh, what happened there. Thank you, Congressman Murphy, for that question. And in fact, I was going to jump in when uh, Congressman Farenholt raised the issue of aggregation. Uh, in my investigation, uh, while I certainly agree with uh, the assessment by uh, the Sunlight Foundation that there is a tremendous amount of work we need to do in improving the timeliness and especially the quality of the data, in the instance of the $6 trillion uh, loan anomaly, uh, in my investigation I have found that it is more an issue of aggregation. And, and, and here is what my investigation led to. When we report the loan amount to uh, USA Spending, we are, the instructions tell us to report it at the face value. And in fact, every single time we report for that specific loan, we report it at the face value. Sometimes it goes up and sometimes it goes down based on activity against that loan. But if you aggregate that, unlike other data elements that you can aggregate and they give you an accurate amount, if you aggregate that amount over time, you are going to come up with a ridiculous number. But this is where context becomes the biggest issue we have with open government reporting. Uh, we have to do a significantly better job at informing the public on not what just the data set means, what the data attribute means. So we believe it is the aggregation that was incorrect. When I look at the data on USAspending.gov, it is accurate for the Department of Education. Thank you. Mr. Wahlberg, five minutes, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And um, thank you to the panel for being here. I want to follow up on Mr. Farenthold's questioning of, of Ms. Miller by moving uh, similar. And I listen to that question, but I want to move to Dr. Harrison and Mr. Smith. Uh, with this question, has the Obama administration been helpful in assisting your department in creating your open government plan and your efforts? Uh, to meet the open government directive? And I would ask of both, and maybe we can start, Dr. Harris. Uh, absolutely. I, I think the, the, the number one help, if you will, would be in the, in the way of a challenge. Uh, and we look at the Department of Education, we look at open government in two ways, probably a slightly unconventional way. One is certainly providing data to the general public. Uh, in a way where they can take the data and do what they need to do with it. But the other piece that we push hard on is collaboration. And when you initially hear the word collaboration, you are thinking of the public collaborating with the government. But when you look at our um, Race to the Top program, when you look at our innovation program, we are actually providing data to the public that they can collaborate with each other. This is where we feel true innovation and in education comes from, not just interacting with the Federal Government. So the Obama administration has helped us with that kind of out-of-the-box thinking. Mr. Smith. Thank you, Mr. Congressman. Uh, yes, I think it, it was a, a, a very uh, collaborative effort. Uh, as Dr. Harris has said, uh, the Secretary asked me to serve on a working group that the White House convened, and I think every agency was asked to do that, and, and we worked through. And I, I think a testament to that is um, Ms. Miller and other groups such as OMB Watch being invited also to comment as we developed these plans to make sure that we had a full and open uh, conversation as each, and a, each agency developed their plans and we shared those plans across the Federal Government and sought to put out the best product, and then we iterated those as we went forward. And I think one of the most important things is that as we are looking at transparency, collaboration, and participation, how does that drive the mission forward? What is the economic impact? If we are putting data out there, what is the ability for citizens to take that and have an economic impact for us in those rural areas, or if it is food safety? Uh, how do we push the nation forward by being more open, transparent, accountable? Thank you. Well, very important with both entities to have that transparency and uh, um, the administration as well. Let me, let me continue the questioning with uh, you two gentlemen. Uh, under OMB's directive, each agency selected a high level, uh, quote, high level official to oversee the open government initiatives. 
How did your agency select its high-level official and what considerations did you undergo in, in the uh, selection process? Uh, at the Department of Education, we, we certainly did not see the issue as a technology issue. Uh, it was more of a business processing issue. Uh, I am currently the senior accountable uh, official for data quality at the Department of Education. Uh, I had wore for many years at the Department of Education the chief uh, financial officer hat, and, but I am a technologist. But what is more important is, as the official, I bring together individuals, subject matter experts from the program offices, subject matter experts from finance, and subject matter experts from uh, technology to make sure that we get it right. So that is kind of how we did it. Mr. Smith. Uh, sir, the Secretary asked me to take the lead, uh, but it was very clear that I myself was not going to get this done, so we had a team-based approach. We built a, a rigorous governance structure around it. It was uh, myself and the Deputy Undersecretary for Natural Resource and Environment, and we have a, actually have a, a meeting, a standing executive steering committee made up of undersecretaries, deputy undersecretaries across all the mission areas uh, to ensure that we continue on this effort and make steady progress. Okay. Thank you. I yield back my time. Thank you. I am yielding myself five minutes here, and I think we are approaching a time for a vote. Just to give you a heads up on it real quick. It should hit about the time we hit the break in between. But I have several questions I want to, do, I want to be able to talk through uh, with Dr. Harris and Mr. Smith, especially on it. How do you choose the data sets? Uh, from what I am seeing, what is coming out, there was a requirement to get at least three high value data sets. How were those chosen? What was the process you went through? If you could be brief, I have got a ton of questions. Sure. As you are well aware, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, we have a very, very visible secretary in Arnie Duncan. Right. Uh, Mr. Duncan spends a tremendous amount of time on the road, and he is constantly asking the citizens, what information do you want? Much of our information flows down from senior leadership in that way, and that is kind of how we uh, decided. Okay. Well, I will come right back to that as sure. well. Go ahead, Mr. Smith. I think I, I just alluded to it. We tried to apply a lens uh, to all our data sets that said, how are we pushing the economy forward, how is the value of these data sets from safety and security of the food supply in every mission area, increasing exports, how can we put information out there that furthers the goals of the nation as we move forward? Now, would that be for data.gov or USA Spending, or would that be the same for right. both of those? We applied this to any data, any information asset within our mission areas. When you are choosing, as far as priority of where to put things, obviously your agency has a very good website for both of your agencies and the information that are out there. When you are choosing information, where does it land? The agency website, data.gov, usaspending.gov, all the above? How do you there are multiple other portals that are out there as well. Actually, all of the above. In fact, prior to USA Spending, data.it.gov provided 20 tool sets and data sets out there for our customers and clients to use. We actually looked at how that data was being used and asked the question, what part of this data do you like, what don't you like? Uh, yes, we apply it again to the, to the whole portfolio. And let me give you a quick example. So farmers markets, we expose the information on where all the farmers markets are in the nation, and we have seen maps produced. So we are having an impact on small businesses and farmers to sell uh, fresh produce throughout the country and hope that that increases traffic to sure. those markets. Well, I, I spent time obviously going through a, a lot of a lot of the things that are out there as far as information, try to get a good handle on it. But one of the interesting things, I am sure you have done the same thing on it, when I go to data.gov and I input uh, agriculture or I go through the search features and there are multiple different vehicles for that or education on that, when I do for data.gov and ask for just raw data on it for education, it comes up with nine data sets that come up for education. And for uh, agriculture, it comes up with 20 total. And the 20 that are out there, all but the farmer's market one you just illustrated, all of them are from previous years. Uh, they are older data on that. And so just trying to process through, obviously, there are multiple places I think it is located. It is just having data.gov, the goal of it was to have a place where you type it in, it all comes up there, and it is actually not coming up there when you get a chance to start doing the search on it. We will so, certainly go, go back and, and take a look at that. And the point is to have a kind of a one stop shop right. uh, information portal. So we will certainly look at that. Some of the data sets were existing, but there were others that had not been uh, exposed uh, through that manner. Uh, one is the USDA Nutritional uh, Nutrient Database, and that was one I talked about, in which people are now making mobile applications. Uh, in order to reduce right. obesity and, and increase uh, uh, the health of our constituents. Sure. Dr. Hirsch, you want to and Mr. That Chairman, up. I think you are actually highlighting the very important issue of context. Right. Uh, for example, when you look at the CFDA database and you look at USA spending, the average citizen would expect to see the exact same number in both places. Correct. But in fact, the reporting is done at different periods of time. 
are we doing a good enough job in explaining to the average citizen the period of time, the context of the data? The answer is no. We need right. to do a better job. Well, I think what we have created, and it is the, the energy that the Obama administration has put out saying, let's get this out there. But now we have created so many different sites, .gov, that are out there. No one really knows where to go to get it. And we don't have a single portal to say, go here, and it will link to everything else. And, and we are missing that on that. Uh, so that, that is a big piece I think we have got to be able to resolve on this, just getting the basics of, of where it goes from there. Um, as, as far as searchable pieces, and this is another thing from US, um, USA Spending, one of the things that I found often when I would go through, and uh, USDA had a piece of it, um, uh, there is a, uh, an Excel file that would come up on it, multiple different versions of it, but it would have the address, for instance, all in one file. So when I wanted to search for Oklahoma and say what are all the different grants that are out there for Oklahoma, it is not possible to do. Uh, because if I just type in OK as a search, I get every look, crook and hook uh, coming up as well in my search. And uh, so uh, just the basics of breaking up the fields becomes very important. What data standards do you put out there to say this is how every single database is going to be put out to make it consistent and searchable? Well, I think you are pointing to one of the challenges uh, many of us face in large Cabinet level agencies or any large organization, uh, corporate or private uh, or public, is, is that there are multiple systems brought up over time, and that many of them in nonstandard manners. So it is a, a very large lift to go back and standardize uh, in, in each and every area. So we are very focused on that, in particular in the areas we are focused on right now in transparency and the reporting areas you have talked about, uh, we have been able to take the existing data, put it into a readable format and get it out there. Uh, when you draw that, throw that net even, even more largely, uh, there are challenges out there and we consistently strive uh, to work on those. Uh, a good example of what we are doing in the Department of Agriculture is we re, uh, farmers report acreage reporting multiple different ways across multiple programs. So we have set out uh, to use the National Information Exchange Model as the standard not only the farmer uses, but agribusiness and government so that everybody can report and share information in the same manner. Right. Well, I would assume every different one of those groups, as well as every uh, grant that is out there, has a unique ID that is using. It is difficult even to track, is this the same vendor as this? They have a similar name or they might have a little different on it. Is there a way to be able to set up and say, this is the unique ID? So if we are searching, no matter if they have a subset underneath that general agency, we can still track it and say, all of those that have this name. Okay. They are all here and we can search all of them. Is that possible to be able to do? Yeah. I mean, the, C Please, Chris. the CCR and Dunn's effort uh, look to get one master vendor data file in which that solves the, the, the issue of, of contractors and who we are working with. And I think we made great strides on that front, but it, it remains an issue that we are working on constantly to keep that, that data clean. Uh, certainly, this is pointed out, I believe, in the, in the uh, Sunlight Foundation's uh, report, uh, something that we have known for many years, that an entity could have multiple DUNS numbers, right. and oftentimes if they are not linked properly and you are making decisions based on aggregate data, you are not making good decisions. And so a lot of work needs to be done in a unique identifier for those Great. Give me a timing on that. What are you thinking as far as, as, far as work to be done? I know this has been ongoing for a while. How does that get resolved and what kind of time period is needed to resolve that? Is that, uh, I would say it this way, is that up the food chain from you? Someone in OMB is going to have to be able to handle some of those things, or is that something that is within the agency? I, I believe it is up the food chain, but I, I okay. think it is also a partnership with, uh, sure. with the public. Uh, because they are the ones who have to, to do business with the Federal Government. They are the ones who have to actually get these identifiers, and they have to concur that one identifier for the entity makes sense and that they are willing to do it. So, but to answer your question, how far away is that, I don't believe we have even started in really aggressively attacking that issue. Okay. Well, thankfully, we have someone from OMB that is going to be hanging out in the next panel, and uh, we will get a chance to ask that question in a moment. Looking to see if there are other members that have approached my time has expired on that. But I want to thank you very much for coming. We will have a panel that will be following immediately. If you would like to be able to stay around, we have votes that are going to be happening momentarily and to be able to hear Mr. Werfel's comments or you're free to be able to leave as well. Thank you very much for being here. And if we have additional follow-up questions, we will try to contact you directly. With this, this panel is concluded.